drama. That's the thing that can kill a YouTube channel. How many of these YouTube channels do you recognize? These are YouTubers whose channels have died from YouTube drama. Onision, real name Gregory Jackson, is very well known on this platform for striking down videos. So if you're able to see this video, please hit like and share so it's shared around before it disappears. Anision started his YouTube channel in 2006, initially posting videos about his life, life experiences, a little bit of comedy. Over time, the channel grew in popularity. He was, he was there at the birth of the platform. He touched upon controversial topics, including me forgetting to put my glasses on at the start of this video, mental health, relationships, and social justice issues. Anision gained a huge following, which but into other channels. Basically, he would either review your body, talk about controversial topics, upload rants, it could be songs, it could be weird kind of skits. These skits would include his friends, his collaborators, his girlfriends at the time, his girlfriends, boyfriends, partners. Really is very, very muddy in which I'm sure I can link down below into even more deep dives. Over time, his erratic behavior seemed to have attracted attention. And although his demographic was quite young and quite feverish, almost cult-like, over time, it started to become a bit creepy. And this is where the creepiness Art imitated life. Anision has been wrapped up in many controversies over the years. Allegation of emotional abuse, manipulation, sexual misconduct, including minors. Now, with America, they have different age laws dependent on what state you happen to be in. So the idea of talking to a 16 year old and inviting her into a state in which consensual sex is 16, not 18. America has this gray kind of feeling. In the UK, 16 is the age of consent. But I generally believe that you're not really truly an adult until you're like 18, 21, that kind of thing. So I can understand why there was a weird kind of taboo behind the idea of him seducing and being sexually active with 16 year olds. In 2019, there was a documentary called The Anision Files released. This detailed some of the allegations against Gregory, his behavior towards young women, and this led to significant backlash. I mean, he'd been on the platform for an extended period of time. It'd always been that weird, quirky, dirty, uh, creepy side of YouTube that YouTube does have, unfortunately. But this shone such a spotlight that YouTube finally started removing his ability to make a living from the platform. Bear in mind that he'd been doing it since 2006. He'd had millions of views, viral songs, he'd made income, he'd bought multiple houses based on this income. So he'd done fairly well, but now YouTube noticed that there's something seedy, something weird. And this is when they started demonetizing his channels. I believe he's got three or four with multiple, like that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of subscribers. Once YouTube demonetized him, other platforms followed suit. He was removed from Patreon and Twitch, in which he then started his own OnlyFans and started doing adult-based content on there. Bear in mind that if you've been courting younger people when, in 2006, and it's now 2022, that's 16 years that they've grown up, so they've if they've liked this dude, then they're possibly old enough to join OnlyFans. Now in 2021, Anision was charged with possession of what I only like to refer to as CP, which he pleaded not guilty to. There's currently other civil suits against him, including one which I found paperwork filed on the 2nd of March, 2023. Since all these like controversies, his popularity has taken a, a huge kicking, his reputation as well, rightly or wrongly, in all honesty. He continues to make income on OnlyFans. He continues to make income external from YouTube. He's uploaded the odd video to YouTube. Odd as in sporadic, not odd as in weird. But this just goes to show that the wild, wild west of YouTube has come to an end. The creepy weirdness that you could find on the platform is slowly being chipped away. Don't get me wrong, it's not perfect. But Gregory Jackson is gone for now. But for how long? Shane Dawson started a YouTube channel in 2008. He was the shock jock, weird kind of funny kid of YouTube. He posted videos performing skits, random impressions and parodies. Over time, Shane Dawson accelerated his growth to nearly 10 million subscribers, making him the, one of the apex creators on the platform. He went off and made his own movies. He had huge amounts of media placed against him. He'd be the poster child of things like VidCon. He'd be making millions. 
millions and millions. His edgy humour led to controversy, but that kind of just stoked his growth. His ability to kind of pander to his younger demographic helped him grow along with this young platform, and they saw him grow, go through his personal life struggles, through his weight loss, through his surgery, through his mental health, through his coming out as gay, and the apex of his career was two, three years ago when he started pumping out conspiracy theories. Large investigative documentaries such as The Rise and Fall of Logan Paul, Jake Paul, things like that, Jeffree Star, etc. These were getting tens of millions of views per video. Real deep dives, real must watch TV YouTube thingies. Over the years, his edgy personality also laid the foundation for his downfall, where his skits, he would act in blackface and play a black character. He would say highly inappropriate things. He would drop the N-word. Over time, he would address these two or three times until in 2020, the wave of wokeness slapped him in the face. Digging back through his old videos once again and having shrugged off previous controversies with a typical YouTube I'm sorry apology. You know, one of those things that is clearly scripted that shrugs itself off in two, three months time, it hasn't affected them. In 2020, he finally sat down and owned it, just like Jenna Marbles had previously. This time, the media truly wasn't going to let him go with the racial slurs and the mocking minorities and the old YouTube videos that no matter how many times you delete them, they're still there on the internet. So he stepped away from the platform. This is where Rumours started swirling around and accusations started arriving of sexual misconduct, predatory behaviour towards minors, several fans and former collaborators suggesting that his behaviour was a bit weird around them, and Shane Dawson disappeared off of the platform for a, just over a year. This resulting in him being dropped by his sponsors, business partners, and then he disappeared on his hiatus. Shane Dawson would return in 2021 with a video that was kind of an apology, but not an apology. He clearly came back to his persona where he's just kind of joking and laughing, he was dodging things, he was vlogging things with his partner Ryland, he's launched yet another makeup line with his, his business partner Jeffree Star. Overall unfortunately this just goes to show that sometimes if you're a big YouTube star and your audience is dedicated enough, you can be fairly Teflon. Now yes, this has caused problems, yes, he might not be as big as he was two, three years ago, but he continues to earn money. He's a very wealthy man. Whether or not his return will be the resurrection of Shane Dawson or just him bimbling along earning income from his YouTube videos from his loyal audience we'll have to see but as proved by some other people sometimes controversy doesn't always kill you. Calvin Lee Vale, known online as Leafiest here or simply Leafy, mostly known for being an American YouTuber and Twitch creator. He was mostly known for his commentary and reactionary content, and he started his career initially in 2011. This was Minecraft gameplay videos, and this is how he initially attracted his sizable audience. Over time, however, he realized that controversy truly does create an audience, so he started leaning into reactionary content. This is where he would go viral very quickly with his content that he could churn out one, two, three videos a day, he could pick on a topic, he could churn his way through it, he could either commentate over existing game footage where he just brain vomits at the video. In some cases he had face cam, in some cases he didn't, in other cases he would react to weird things that happen to be on the internet, leading into almost bullying if not reacting to certain content. This emotive response and this quick turnarounds was absolute rocket fuel for his channel. He's one of the forefront runners of this kind of toxic commentary channel niche that emerged, rocketing him to 4 million subscribers in 2016. The more he poked the bear, the more views he would get. The more sarcastic he was, the more toxic his audience got, but the more toxic the audience was, the more they loved him for it. He played on this dark humour, this storytelling. He had a distinctive style, a distinctive sound to his content, and due to the age demographic of his channel, it was easy to listen to, easy to follow, and it was viral. Now, with rapid growth comes rapid attention. This was around about the time when YouTube started to try and look at its public persona, and the last thing they want is someone sat on the platform actively bullying people or attacking them, going out of their way to make constant series about them. 
in a bullying light. He was fell into situations where he was barreling into people with, with mental health difficulties. The more he pushed, the more he poked, the more rabid his audience got, the more they'd generate user-generated content, the more they'd hold Leafy up as this toxic god of commentary. This led to feuds with people such as Ethan Klein from H3H3, iDubs, and even Inision for a period of time. And the last thing you want is to be embroiled in a toxic fight with Inision, who's also been very good at doing this attention-grabbing viewer virality game for many, many years. Every controversy raised his channel. Every controversy brought him more money. Every controversy gave him more subscribers and more views and more influence, dare I say. But then he got slammed by the YouTube policy. Permanently banned in 2020 for multiple violations of the YouTube community guidelines. Basically, they started shadow banning him for his bullying antics, for his negative commentary. And although his fans were loyal, after a while, the algorithm started to kill the channel, the amount of views he was getting. So he went from millions of views per videos to tens of thousands of views, and then he was gone from the platform entirely. Shortly after that, Twitch also leveled the ban hammer, although they didn't give any specific reasons for their ban from their end. And since then, Leafy has just disappeared. Now, they do say that he made some real estate investments with his money. You've got to think that he he made a fair bit of money, considering the amount of views he was getting at his peak. He continues to be a very sporadic guest on Drama Alert with Killer Keemstar. But overall, it just goes to show that yes, you can find a niche. Yes, you can grow an audience incredibly quickly. But when it comes to the YouTube platform, unless you play by their guidelines, you can be deplatformed very quickly. David Dobrik, a highly successful former Vine user that came over to YouTube. His high impact, high energy vlogs is what attracted his audience to him and grew a brand. This brand allowed him to amass friends together, the vlog squad, and push them out into YouTube fame. Pretty much anyone associated with David Dobrik was able to launch a YouTube channel, push a brand out there, and generate some form of life and income from it. However, he's also faced a lot of controversy, and that's what we're talking about today. First of all, David Dobrik found his first slice of fame on Vine. Vine was TikTok before TikTok was TikTok. Basically, vertical format content in which people would sing and joke around. That's where the likes of Logan Paul and Jake Paul and things like that came from. He transitioned over to YouTube in 2015 quite successfully. Not many Viners actually made the jump in time. His fast-paced comedic vlogs featuring pranks, surprises, and celebrity appearances attracted a massive audience, growing to nearly 18 million subscribers in 2021. Once again, the Vlog Squad, which was a rotating cast of friends, would help fuel his blogs. The way it would work is he'd basically invite people in, they would become part of his posse, they'd create content together, they'd share subscribers between each other, they'd do crazy weird funny pranks on each other, upping the level over and over and over again. This led to huge commercial success, a juggernaut of a brand that would get tens of millions of views every video. This led to huge brand deals and even creating his own photo app, which in all honesty I've never used, called Dispo. At the height of his fame, nobody can touch David Dobrik. The problem is, is it was his fame that kneecapped David Dobrik. As things started getting crazier and crazier, David put his friends in the way of danger, including smashing one of his own friends into the side of a crane while swinging from a crane. This broke the dude's eye socket, causing lots of surgery issues, and it seems that once out of the way, that friend was no longer valuable to David Dobrik, so therefore, that was it. He was out of the vlog squad and wasn't helpful. Now, this has led to lots of controversies, including lawsuits being levied against David Dobrik. And this was the first chink in his armor. In 2021, there was additional major controversies, this time leading to sexual assault allegations, where a woman accused Don Zeglitis which I've probably pronounced wrong wildly, a member of his vlog squad of assaulting a woman during a video shoot in 2018. She was unconscious, she was intoxicated, unable to keep consent. Dobrik, who filmed and uploaded this content, featuring the woman in itself, faced major backlash, being labelled as someone that was enabling the assault. And 
Unfortunately, there were stories of people hiding the story, the idea that fame and money can make problems go away. But at this point in time, the community had already started riling around the kind of Me Too movement on the platform, trying to eliminate uh, troublemakers or problems. And this, I, I call this the Jake Paul effect. If you're raised on sensationalism and making money from just outlandish things, then sooner or later people are going to come and deplatform you. And Dobrik had a long, hard fall to cover. Following the accusations, David Dobrik released two apology videos. The first one seemed a bit dismissive. The second one seems a little bit more polished by a media team. He acknowledged his past mistakes and promised to learn from them, and he vowed for safer environments in his videos. Over time, in wakes of the controversy, he lost his sponsors with DoorDash, EA Sports, and Dollar Shave Club, and he also stepped down from his role at Dispo to avoid negative impact on the company due to the controversy. After a while, David Dobrik returned to YouTube in 2021. He posted a few videos, but as of now, it's been dormant for about a year. He seems more active on Snapchat now than any other platform. Maybe that's because he can control his audience. Maybe it's because he can control the output of his content. And maybe he's made more than enough money and he doesn't need to deal with it anymore. It just goes to show once you grow a huge social media empire, if you've managed your money well enough, you can choose what platforms you want to be on. Will the allegations follow him from platform to platform? Will his recklessness continue? Or does he not care anymore and it's a new vlog squad wrapping around him? Nicole Arbour, Canadian comedian, choreographer, social media influencer, former Toronto Raptors cheerleader. She smashed onto YouTube, she grabbed attention, and she grew her fame online. But this didn't come without controversy. Nicole Arbour, known for her provocative style and unapologetic humour, her career filled with highs and lows. Initially a cheerleader for the Toronto Raptors national basketball team, she transitioned to entertainment, even become a music video choreographer. She eventually gained significant recognition as a comedian. And of course, anyone that's savvy with social media would also step into YouTube. Her brand of humour is often controversial and inflammatory, taking knocks at social commentary in general. Her fame is largely due to courting this controversy and learning very cleverly how to ride it, use it as fuel to, to grow her infamy, so to speak. Her first viral hit being the Dear Fat People video in 2015, which has had millions of views and sparked a widespread conversation, albeit I mean negative light. This was the first of many controversies for Nicole Arbour. In the Dear Fat People video, she makes a series of derogatory comments about overweight people. Critics accuse her of promoting fat shaming, whilst others defend it as a form of dark humour. Some, including notable YouTube personalities and media outlets, criticised Arbour for promoting a harmful and demeaning attitude towards people struggling with obesity. I personally, as a fat person, that it was aimed at, I, I get it. I, I get the, the, the humour, I get the angle of attack. I also, as a social media person that teaches social media, understand why she went so heavy, because my professional staff, but it, it got a reaction. You need on the internet to either generate sympathy, people that are intrigued in your life, or outrage to react to them. As a wrestling fan, I can explain this a little bit better. Your favourite wrestling superstar you either absolutely love or absolutely hate. The people that never really make a splash, the ones in the middle that are just, eh, you forget very quickly. Also in 2015, Nicole Arbour's ex-boyfriend, Matthew Santoro, accused her of physically and emotionally abusing him during their relationship, something that Arbour denies. Now, this also sparked outrage, but was also tied into the Me Too movement. This was the first time that a male person had come out expressing abuse via the YouTube platform. There was a lot of sympathy for Matthew Centauro, and yes, there was a response from Nicole Arbour, but in all honesty, this kind of simmered down and didn't really go anywhere. Not as much as you would expect from, say, a Toby Turner, Alex Day, Anision, or anybody else that came out with a similar story at the same time. Each controversy brought attention, made people aware that she existed, and then because that attention is there, she was able to make videos, content, gain subscribers from this notoriety. The next 
controversy was the fake world record claim that in June 2019, Nicole claims she broke a world record with her video World's Sexiest Comedian. However, the claim was false, but once again, gained attention. Dear Black People, another controversial video by Arba was accused of racism, culture insensitivity, and many viewers found her comments inappropriate and offensive. Once again, from a professional standpoint, I'm not condoning anything she says or does, but this is grabbing attention. This is what she wanted and needs for her career. The more offensive, the more insulting, the more outrageous, the more you're going to get attention. Have a look at people like Alex Jones, Katie Hopkins, even Leafy is here on this platform. All have the same thing. If they oh, what? How, how dare you say that? You're now talking about that person. You're now talking about what they do. You may have mentioned that Alex Jones sells supplements online and Katie Hopkins does speeches and what are, you're now semi-promoting them via outrage and you're making more and more people aware that they exist. Outrage marketing truly does work. Have a look at people like Jake Paul, Logan Paul, Andrew Tate for that matter, and Nicole Arbor was fantastic at brewing up this attention and then molding it into the way that she wanted it to be. As of 2021, Nicole Arbor continues to create content and maintain an active presence on social media, such as YouTube and Instagram. While her content continues to attract viewers, it also continues to incite controversy. And in a recent turn, just to continue to gain attention, she's now attracted the attention of Cardi B after taking pot shots at the music of Offset. Comedian versus rapper, more attention for her, more mainstream eyes on her. Every year or so, if she upsets someone, she can draw people in, get attention, earn money, and more people know who she is.